He's not distant. He's not in a building. He is everywhere. And so who is God to you? Think about it. We're going to move along with our message for today. It's called Revive Us Again. Revive Us Again. And our scripture today is from Psalm 85. If you have your Bibles there with you, you can turn to Psalm 85. And I think we have it up here on the screen. Yes, we do. <clears throat> Psalm 85, 1 through 13. And it begins like this. First of all, it's a prayer that the Lord will restore favor. Favor to the land, to the chief music, and it is written to the chief musician, a psalm of the sons of Korah. Psalm 85, 1 through 13. Lord, you have been favorable to your land. Or you have shown favor to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. We have a different, I have a different version. It's kind of small for me, so I will go ahead and try to read this version. Lord, you have been favorable to your land. You have brought back the captivity of Jacob. You have forgiven the iniquity of your people. You have covered all their sin, Selah. You have taken away all your wrath. You have turned from the fierceness of your anger. Restore us. O oh God of our, of our salvation, and cause your anger toward us to cease. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your mercy, Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will hear what God the Lord will speak. For he will speak peace to his people and to his saints. But let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him. That glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. Truth shall spring out of the earth and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yes, the Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him, and he shall make his footsteps our pathway. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to hear your word. We thank you, Lord God, for your people today. We thank you, God, for those who have come, and we thank you, God, for their hearts. And I pray, God, that their hearts would be open to receive the word that you've given me, God. God, I pray, God, that you would make us fertile ground to hear your word. Lord, that you would pour out your anointing on us in this virtual service, that you would enter in and, and be here and preside over God. We just thank you, God, because we know that you are everywhere and that you are here with us. And so, Lord, I just thank you, God, for just your, your grace and your mercy. I thank you, God, for your revival. I thank you, God, for your transformation in our lives. And we pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Amen, everybody. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for his word. Praise the Lord for his work in our lives. And as I said previously, the name of our sermon is Revive Us Again from Psalm 85. And I just read in your hearing verses 1 through 13. Now, just a little bit of background before we get started. Interpreters are generally of the opinion that this psalm was written after the return of the Jews out of their captivity in Babylon.
seven generations after Korah died, the prophet Samuel arose from the line of Korah. The Korahites later became doorkeepers and custodians for the tabernacle. One group of Korahites joined King David in various military exploits and won the reputation of being expert warriors. And during the time of King David, the sons of Korah, as we read in the beginning of this Psalm, the sons of Korah became leaders in choral and orchestral music in the tabernacle. Among the biblical Psalms, there are 11. 11 Psalms are attributed to the sons of Korah. So what we're going to try to do in the exposition of this Psalm is to bring it into the present, to, to make, it, make, it, make it meaningful for us today because we know the Bible, God's word is for all time, not just for that time. It's not just for the Jews who were returning to Babylon, but it has a message for us today. And that message that I've chosen is again, revive us again. My first point today is rejoice in what God has done. Rejoice in what God has done. Rejoice in what God has done. And I'm looking at verses one through three, where it talks about God being favorable, God having done good things for his people. So my question to us is, what do you think? Or what do we think about what God has done for us? He has shown us favor when we didn't deserve it, not just in the salvation process, not just in Jesus Christ and his, his, um, uh, his sacrifice on the cross, but in the continual sin that we find ourselves in, God continues to deliver us from those things. Yesterday, I went outside at about 3.30 in the afternoon to empty the trash. And I looked up in the sky and there was this dark blanket of clouds covering half the sky. So when I think about this Psalm, I think about God's people experiencing joy, coming back to a land from which they had been exiled. But I also think about God's displeasure, about God's people, being under a cloud of darkness. Everything was dark and dismal and ruined after 70 years. And I want us to think back. Some of us really understood what happened when we were saved. Some of us were saved early on in our years and didn't understand what it meant, but there was some point or should have been some point in our, our history, our, our redemption history, where we really understood what happened on the cross that day, and we really understood the favor that God had, has shown us. We really understood then the things that we had done and why they were wrong and how God delivered us from that sin. We came to understand that we were enveloped in darkness from all the things we had done and from all the mistakes that we had made. And then that repentance, that, that forgiveness, that salvation moment was followed by the joy of being forgiven, the joy of knowing that our God went to the cross for us and that we were forgiven for something that he paid for. We were forgiven that something that our Lord Jesus Christ paid for on a cruel cross. And we know today that every sin was cast into the sea of 
forgetfulness. We know that we owe it all to Jesus. We know that he covered all of our sin with his spilled blood. And for that, we can rejoice today. For that, we can be glad. For that, we can lift our hands. For that, we can shout hallelujah. For that, we can say amen. But you know, after we have that moment of joy, knowing what God has done for us, then the work begins. Then the work begins. My next point, revival implies spiritual decline. Revival implies spiritual decline. So God's people here, so God's people are in spiritual decline. Even though they're joyful for their return to the land, they're still in spiritual decline. And here <clears throat> in verse four, the psalmist asks, restore us, O God of our salvation. Cause your anger to cease against us. Please don't allow your displeasure to continue. Will you be angry forever? Hmm. So revival and restoration have to come or should come after spiritual decline. I wanna talk a little bit about spiritual decline. Imagine this group of people returning to a land God had given them. And even though they would, there was joy, they were tired, tired from the long trip, tired because even though they were back in the land, they had to rebuild. Have you ever experienced joy and tiredness at the same time? The psalmist asked God to put away his displeasure toward his people. He asked him to forget about the things of the past. And he asked them to bless them in the future. And so he asked, how long, God? How long are you going to be angry with us? How long are we going to experience this decline? How long are we going to experience this difficulty? One generation, every generation, how long, God? How long will you be hidden from us? You see, <clears throat> joy is not always a smile on our faces. But many times, though we have joy on the inside, there's a tiredness that sweeps over us. We know God is with us. Time after time after time, challenges appear, don't they? They just seem to come. They loom over us like dark clouds overhead, only to be faced with 16 foot waves coming our way, ready to knock us off our feet. Oh, we're thankful that God is in control, but sometimes saints, we are just tired. I can talk about this because I've been there if I may, even with the joys we've experienced of seeing God work during this pandemic, there is a tiredness, a darkness that has settled not, on, not only over God's people, but over the world. And the waves keep coming, waves of grief, waves of disharmony in family relationships, waves of financial hardship because of things like now we experience furloughs, waves of ill health, waves of unemployment, waves of death swoop for us like we are carcasses ready to be picked clean by a virus vulture. 
there's much more I could talk about, but you know them already. But that was just some of the decline of 2020. And our spiritual decline is evidenced by us being so tired that many times we don't want to engage in those disciplines that cause us to grow in Christ. It's a strange dichotomy of joy on the inside and spiritual decline at the same time. Instead of our circumstances being a distraction, it is a distraction for us to pray. Things are just turned upside down. We try to read our circumstances better than we read the scriptures. We try to read our circumstances better than we read the scriptures. <clears throat> so my third point today is only God can revive the spirit or soul and soul of his people. Only God can revive the spirit and soul of his people. And so here we are, right at the edge of 2021, right at the beginning, with a joy deep down because God has kept us to see another year, but maybe tired of not seeing our families, not being able to travel freely, not being able to gather in large groups with different people who are not our close families. Maybe we're facing our own budget shortfalls. You know, the city of Denver is facing like a 190 million budget shortfalls, but maybe we're facing our own budget shortfalls in the face of this pandemic. So I submit to you today that many of us, or I would even dare say all of us, need revival, that we need to be restored. Not necessarily out of our circumstances, but we need the spiritual grit, G-R-I-T, the spiritual grit to endure. So we may not be able to change the direction of the wind that blows our way, the winds of adversity, we might not be able to change that, but we can set our sails for the right direction, for the direction that leads to us being more like Christ. Are you experiencing the pain of a dull spirit? Is every day sometimes a chore? A question for us or for you. Have you ever had a tooth that you could not get fixed right away and you tried to dull the pain with Orogel? You've seen the Orogel commercials or Ambisol or one of those other topical anesthetics. So what happens? You can hold off for a little while but it won't be long before that tooth is throbbing and make you want to cry. Because maybe what you really needed was to treat the problem, which might be an abscess. So antibiotics are needed, not a mask of over-the-counter remedies. So my illustration here demonstrates how easy it is for us as Christians to do the same thing spiritually. We know there's a problem because we feel the pain inside. We feel that, that emptiness inside. We feel that void inside. But we only treat the symptoms and leave the real problem unresolved. We want to go to church and pop a few sermons or music hits into our playlist and leave feeling all better. Did y'all hear me? We want to go to church and pop a few sermons 
or music hits into our playlist and leave feeling all better. These things certainly have their place, but if our real need is for a revival, then relying on other things to cure our spiritual pain is defeating and will never work. Relying on things to cure our spiritual pains and defeats will never work. We can't fix our revival need with more good deeds or more good church programs. So what then has to happen? In order for true revival to take place, we have to have an inner work by the Lord and no one else. An inner work by the Lord and no one else. Recently, I discovered some things about myself that were not pleasant for me to hear from the Lord. And ever since, I've been working on them, but not go before going through something for him to show me something about yourself. You see, when you go through something or when you make poor choices, God really is trying to speak to you speak to you about something. He's trying to give you insight about yourself. I want you to think about, <coughs> excuse me, think about some things that have happened to you recently. Think about some choices you've made. Think about maybe some contentious moments with someone in your family. Think about how you responded. And then I want you to think about what God is saying to you. Because you know for us, sometimes it's always about the other person. And we take that focus, take that reflection off of us. But I'm telling you today, that many times God wants you to reflect on you. He wants you to reflect on deep stuff that's deep down inside. <clears throat> Things that may have been hidden that are now coming to light about who you are, about who we are, and how then he wants us to be transformed for a better future. And better, I don't mean necessarily better that we'll have no circumstances or have no suffering or have no issues. I mean better by being more like Christ, about being transformed in mind, about looking more like him. We can easily see that our society is in a state of spiritual decline. I don't even have to tell you the, the, some of the things that, that we see that are in decline. But what about the decline in the spirituality among the followers of Christ? Remember, this psalm was written to God's people. And so we need to turn to the Lord before we could ever hope to even affect any real change in our society. In Psalm 85 here, the psalmist describes the problem and what it means to return to the Lord. Who is faithful to draw us back to himself? God is faithful to draw us back to himself when we return to him. Nothing can replace the reviving and life refreshing touch of the Lord. We ought to all proclaim with this psalm, O oh Lord, revive us again. O oh Lord, revive us again, or revive me again. The beginning of revival then is about being brutally honest, about being brutally honest with yourself 
about where you struggle and about what you struggle with. Where do you struggle and what do you struggle with? So what is the struggle? What is the psalmist talking about here? In verses eight through 11, what is the struggle? The root problem is dealing with, it is, is in dealing with our struggles and God's demand for righteousness. We've spoken many times that God is a God of love, which, which we all like and which we all love that he's a God of love, but we don't, we don't like so much that he's a God of righteousness. We don't like that he's a God about what's right and what's just. The need for revival always springs from some sort of idolatry, some sort of, 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 of something that we put before God. And revival is needed because the true God has been replaced with a false God, which is idolatry. You know, some of us don't think we have false gods, but I'm telling you, we do. I do, you do, we all do have false gods that we place before the true God. We all worship some things. We all have thoughts about some things. We all have some greed. We all have some stuff that we need to deal with that we have not or refuse to deal with. Our actions though, will prove where our thoughts and allegiances lie. God's divine demands must be dealt with. God's wrath against sin is an area of Christian life that is often overlooked because it can be uncomfortable. It is just like us in some areas of our lives to pull up the covers and not even want to look at those things. We have to be taken aback to where we should be in our salvation and walk with God or establish a new norm in our walk with God. We ought to establish a new precedent in our walk with God. We can't do the same old, same old. We can't always go back to where we were and having that, that joy of salvation because we have to what? We have to grow up. We have to grow up. We have to think, okay, where should I be today? Where should my walk be today? What should my new norm be today? because I can't be the same old person that I was yesterday. I need to be a new person today and a new person going forward because there's always something that God wants to do in our lives. We need to know where we stand with God because being on the wrong side or the right side of God makes all the difference. We need a rescuing and a deliverance from all our sins. And we need to do that continually because we sin all the time. Sometimes it's, it's by choice and sometimes it's not. Sometimes we come to know that we are in a sinful state. And here in this Psalm, I'm not gonna read these verses again, but we need deliverance from foolishness. We need deliverance from foolishness. And God calls us to love him and to love one another and to exhibit this unwavering faith. Because faith springs forth 
from God's people on earth, but God looks down over us with or in righteousness. He expects it. He demands it. Some of us out there who are listening to me today, you are not okay. You are not okay. And the reason why is because you've got this, this upside down thing going on. You haven't looked to God in unwavering faith and you're all caught up in your circumstances, but your circumstances are on top and your faith is on the bottom. But God promises that when righteousness leads our way, when righteousness goes before us, he promises goodness. If we could just see that today, and you know what else our righteousness does? It causes others to see God's glory in the earth. It causes others to see God's glory in the earth when we act like we know who we serve. When we act like we know God today. So 2021 ought to be a different year a year of revival. Where do we struggle? What are we afraid of? What depletes our faith? What takes away from our faith? What is one major way we can have spiritual revival? How can we allow God to transform us more deeply from the inside out? We can fast and pray and read God's word. That is what transforms us from the inside out. I'm just a vessel that brings the truth to God's people. I can't transform you. My family can't transform me. Your children can't transform you. Your spouses can't transform you. Only God can transform you from the inside out. Only he can make that change that needs to be made. So in this week, I want you to do something. I want you to look for a devotional you can do online. I want you to look, maybe you have a devotional that you, that you bought, but you have not finished it or you have not really uh, been been engrossed in what the devotional was really trying to say. Once you find the devotional, I want you to do those exercises every day. Like I mentioned previously, you can look for something on the Bible app. There are pastors that have devotionals, like, um, like Charles Stanley, he has a devotional or a devotional from the Church Without Walls, Ralph Douglas West. He has every day. You can look for a specifically women's devotional or a men's devotional, but find something. Find something to do beginning. You can actually begin this week, but you can certainly begin it with the fast that begins on January 11th. And as you read, and as you are prayerful, and don't just read the devotional, you got to open God's word as you read the devotional because they're directing you to a certain group of scriptures for a reason. And when you read, and when you kind of begin to think about who you are and about who God is, he will begin to re reveal certain things to you about yourself. And it's there, it's there in that moment that the transformation begins to become real. That you will see a different me than you saw today. That God will do a turnaround in your life, a turnaround in your thinking, a turnaround in your just in your behavior, 
He will begin to do that. Don't ignore what God is trying to say to you. Don't pull the covers over your head. Don't shut your Bible. Keep it open. No matter how painful it might get. Let God speak. Let him begin to do the work of revival, the work of transformation, the work of restoration. Let God do it. That's our sermon for today. Revive us again. Revive